Hello, people. Um, I believe a lot of you have heard about blockchain, and um, yeah, there are a lot of nice technologies, but they have some issues as well. And Deb Nicholson will speak about the ethical um, considerations of blockchain. She's from Software Freedom Conservancy, and I believe you will have a good introduction to this topic from her. <laughs> have fun. Thank you. Um, awesome. It's great here to be here at FASDEM, um, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about blockchain. Uh, I am not a blockchain hater, but after 13 years of working in free software, I'm always suspicious of new technology, right? So we should always be a little suspicious and, you know, read the back of the box, so to speak, uh, which I guess is also known as source code. Uh, but so I'm, I'm neither a hater nor like a, a super fan, uh, but I have some I have some questions and some concerns. And I know when we when we say blockchain, uh, I don't know how many people are in this room, but I'm pretty sure that there are that many number of ideas of what we mean when we say blockchain. So there are a lot of different things. I'm going to speak generally, and I'm not going to call out specific coins or specific efforts. But to think of, like, I want us to think about the technology in general and what heading in that direction means for us as technologists and what our responsibility is. So the promise of blockchain is pretty great. Like, most technology that people get excited about sounds pretty great on the front end, of course. Uh, transparency and financial dealings and other dealings, that sounds pretty great. Like, I know anyone who's, like, had a mobile phone has probably been like, what the heck does this contract mean and why does it, why do I keep getting these extra fees? So if you could have transparency with some of your other financial dealings, that would be a real bonus. Uh, the other thing uh, is decentralization. I spent a long time working on GNU Media Goblin because I care deeply about decentralization. I have a lot of worries about what the continual centralizing of online stuff means for us and you know, having, uh, I'm a huge science fiction fan. I've read a lot of books where there's like three companies that control the entire world. And when I first started reading those books, I was like, oh man, that's ridiculous. That would never happen. But it turns out that it's gonna be five. Um, so I have, I have concerns, like the decentralized power is a real bonus for me when we talk about the way that blockchain could work, right? And then efficiency, like, uh, as a person who's done a lot of nonprofit work, I've done a lot of office work. I've done a lot of like work on systems that were designed by someone else who never intended to use them. And I'm like, how come we have to type this in twice? And it's like, oh, because the person who designed the system is never going to type anything in here. So efficiency, the idea of making mundane transactions, especially mundane accounting transactions, more efficient, like, sings to my soul. I. I imagine that there are office employees which if we could gather up all of their wasted work, we could probably build a thousand pyramids. With staplers probably, but you know what I mean. It's, uh, so the efficiency part, I like. Oh, so, well, we're gonna talk about the past. And we're gonna talk about ledgers, which have been around for a really long time. Um, one thing that I found really interesting is that before like the 15th century, uh, we had like a huge mess as far as accounting systems. Like everyone had their own thing. Like, oh, I write on sticks. Like, oh, I like to notch sticks. I like to keep stuff on paper. Like, oh, I like to write down like every day, like what happened. And then you just flip back through like the whole like last four years to see who owes what. Um, so this guy invited, invented double entry accounting, which, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not the most exciting invention. So like, you know, he's not like, there's not like statues like there are of like Galileo and things like that. Um, but double entry accounting was this huge early interoperability thing. It meant that like your books and my books, we could, we could get the same thing going from one to the other. It's like, oh, here's the list of credits on mine and the list of debits on mine, same thing on yours, as opposed to like, what do I do with these sticks? How do I know that those mean I owe you money? That seems weird. Um, so this was great. 
uh, for everyone who could read. Uh, for folks who can read, uh, written down ledgers are awesome. If you can't read, which wasn't everyone in the 14th century, then you still can't really look at the system of debits and credits and have confidence that the person who is telling you you owe them money is being honest, which is a shame. Um, so that is, <laughs> that is a tricky thing. Um, so when we think about replacing a lot of our existing systems with blockchains, it's, it's incumbent on us to make sure that everyone has access to it, like a, a sort of literacy, like a contract literacy. Uh, especially if we're going to like transcend local governments and have a situation where people are just sort of beholden to the system and not uh, without like some of the governmental controls that exist in their specific location. Uh, Hammurabi did this early. Uh, before Hammurabi, the rules of the land were at the whim of the king. Uh, you could get brought in for any offense and uh, and then the punishment could be anything. Hammurabi wrote down, like, if you steal, you lose a hand. If you kill someone, well, it wasn't, I don't want to make it sound like it was this great egalitarian thing. It was like, if you kill someone who is rich, you die. If you kill someone who's poor, you have to give up a cow. It, was, it wasn't perfect. Um, but at least you knew what it was. It was written down. And so it was like transparency. Um, so... I think about the kinds of things that we might codify and, uh, and wanting to make sure that the folks that we codify for them, we codify those things for, are able to understand what we've done. Because um, one person's like, just business is another person's like, very personal tragedy or emptying of their bank account or um, even a, a massacre. It could be like, oh, you know, it, for me it's just business. So. When I think about like, you know, what we might make efficient, it's really important that like we understand what just business means for all of the members of that transaction. And some of the things that we've normalized with ledgers and treaties and things in the past uh, are things that probably should not have been normalized. Uh, so this this is a painting of the Treaty of Penn, uh, which is the eastern part of the United States. So the native people are signing a contract here saying like, yes, all of this land, you can do stuff on it. Um, was there an equal understanding of how long that contract was intended to last or how exclusive that contract was intended to be? Almost certainly not. So you've got like, but it's a contract. So like, you know, later folks can go back and be like, well, your signature's on this. This is a contract. And, you know, it's just business. Uh, and they're like, wait, I, I don't understand. So our understanding of what is up for grabs and what's saleable might not match people that we're able to interact with on the other end. So uh, that and there's always a possibility for a real imbalance in power. So uh, I talked about the mobile contracts earlier, but there are a lot of things like that. Like I don't, this room might have a higher than average number of people that actually read terms of service. How many? Oh, just a little higher than average. They're, they're boring. My dad's a lawyer. He doesn't read them either. But, um, but so uh, for contracts that update over time, uh, the party who's drafted the contract and has the domain-specific expertise is always going to write them in their favor. So it'll be like, oh, the rate will increase according to this particular parameter that as the, you know, the company with like several hundred people employed uh, looking at this market understand very well how that will tip. Whereas the individual person looking at that contract might be like, uh, yeah, I guess like more service, I pay a little more, that seems okay. Like without really understanding the mechanisms by which that will happen. And that could be very, very efficient. It could like, boom, because that's, that's what we want from blockchain is for it to be very, very efficient. So I worry about the things that we might make normal and the, um, and the kinds of transactions that we could provide cover for in systems. And I know they're not all anonymous. Some are, some are, some are not. It depends on, <laughs> Well, it depends on how much you're willing to put in, right? Um, but it's incumbent on us as the people creating these platforms to understand what we might be making 
it easy for something to be normal. Um, and then, you know, so if we change the rules, new rules mean new responsibilities. And, uh, and that means that we have to do some sort of Hammurabi-esque thing where we make it clear what the new rules are. Uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, like stuff that, I've been like, just thinking about stuff that could happen or that has already happened. We have like new kinds of things that could happen. Um, one of the things that people are always talking about is like, oh, we're finally going to like throw off the tyranny of government, of government, which is like, okay. I mean, like, so is this cat stealing? I mean, it didn't pay for pizza. I don't know any cats that have money. But like, most of us would be like, eh, as like an illegal activity, I guess I don't care, right? And there are a lot of things in that category where it's like, eh, I guess I don't care if people want to do that. Um, it may interest you to know that people have been using ledgers uh, to falsify all kinds of activities. Like, so this is an interesting example where um, in the US, trucks, they drive across countries, it's really big, and um, they keep a ledger talking about how much they've slept. And this is supposed to keep the other motorists safe so that everyone knows like, oh, well, you should, you should have slept this much. So the, but they keep two ledgers because you make more money if you go across faster and you don't have to split the pay for the trip with a second driver. So what happens is they keep two sets of ledgers. Um, so we might, we might, by having stuff that is a little bit more anonymized on the, the inputs, be able to see situations where people could thwart local law. Like, and you might think like, well, I know how much sleep I need. Why has the government got to get involved? But when the, the, the balance on that on the other end is like a 18 wheeler going across the median and plowing into a bunch of cars, and it's like, well, we perhaps have an interest there that we would want to keep in track. Um, so there are legitimate reasons for having government control on things. Um, and so, so I worry about the things where people are like, oh, I, I, it's fine, like, I'm, I'm good. The government doesn't need to keep track of me. Uh, I can just do these things because uh, it doesn't always work. So, um, so transparency and control and efficiency. There's always going to be like competing, uh, competing interests here. Um, and I think that we may find that there are a lot of things that we agree on. We may not agree on some things, you know, like, uh, but um, perhaps understanding where we've been and what's happening now, we can extrapolate and hopefully avoid some of the things that we all agree would be bad. Um, so, uh, you know, what if we end up like accidentally coding a dystopia? And I said that, it's like, it used to sound crazy, right? Like, oh, we're just going to have three companies run the world. And it's like, oh, it didn't work out as crazy as I thought. Like, what if we, like, oh, I didn't mean to uh, accidentally code a new feudal regime where, like, everyone is beholden to, like, a particular company. Or, um, you know, I didn't mean to accelerate capitalism so that we ended up with, like, people living in underground bunkers and then like 10 billionaires. I think we still have 20, so we may be doing okay. Um, but, uh, and so, and I don't think any, I don't think anyone in this room, if it was like a button that said like dystopia plus a bonus of 500 bucks, uh, not code the dystopia, would like, would pick the 500 bucks. Like it's never gonna be that obvious, but some of the things that we lay down in technology at the early stages end up perpetuating. So, uh, so this symbol uh, is like an example of something that got used temporarily just to go like, oh, okay, we'll put the at symbol in the middle of the email. Um, and I had actually never thought about this, but there are people that find it bothersome. And in fact, the person who first put the at symbol into our email has since apologized. He's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize we were all gonna have to type this forever in our email for the end of days. So like when email was created, it was like, oh, what's going to happen? And it's like, well, let's just try this for now. And now we, you know, we're never going to get rid of the at symbol. So it's, so some of the choices that we make early on may have uh, repercussions later on, uh, like more serious ones. Like I actually don't mind the at symbol. 
So where are we now? Uh, we have, you know, we have folks, nerdy folks using blockchain, awesome. Um, you know, and it's, it's fun. Uh, we have a lot of people doing speculation, which, you know, the tulip metaphor is like, okay, yeah. Um, but what I think about is like, who actually benefits from speculation? Like, I actually don't care if, if very wealthy people wanna like play games with money and uh, lose like yachts and stuff to each other. I don't have a yacht, so there's not a whole lot of like, oh, that's sad, you lost one of your yachts. Um, but uh, a lot of these kinds of schemes, there are, are a lot of folks who are susceptible to these get-rich-quick schemes. Like, I don't know how many of you have aging parents where you've gotten to the point where they can't spend money without someone else seeing it. But uh, people become susceptible to these things. I worked at a, this was a gross job, but I worked at a place where we called people on the phone and asked them for money. And there was a company you could buy lists from of people who specifically are susceptible to get-rich-quick schemes. And they're like, oh, these people work for a couple years and then lose their whole fortune over and over and over again because they just know they're never going to be rich the regular way. So, it's, uh, so there are people who can be exploited when there are systems that promise like great rewards, just read this very dense 70 page contract, and then wait a few weeks and you'll probably be rich. Uh, so there's a lot of potential for exploitation there. Um, another thing I thought was interesting is uh, because the end-to-end -end situation with uh, blockchains provides, you know, a certain certainty of like what's happening in the network. Um, this is iPay, and it's intended for people who are fleeing a country as a refugee, um, so they can take their bank account with them, uh, and it's the key is their I. Uh, which I guess is, it, it's better than the situation where you don't get to take your money with you at all, but it also creates kind of this gross, weird market for eyes. Um, because you can't, like, so your password gets hacked, right? Okay, you change it. Like, you can only do that once if you have two eyes. Um, and then you're out of eyes. Um, and, like, yeah, like, I, I don't know about you, but when I watch movies and they take someone's eye out for, like, a... Ugh, ugh. Uh, so, so like, I worry about the ways they're like, oh, it's great. Like, so like an unholy mashup of biometrics and blockchain with some problems. Um, I had to point that. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about like hackers and dark web and people using blockchains for, to money launder and do all kinds of transactions. Um, Many of those people have been caught because they didn't understand the traffic analysis situation. They're like, oh, I just made my name like elite hacker, money launderer 72. And, uh, but then like actual money goes into my bank account from some country that's very far away from where I live. So of course that looks suspicious. Um, so the, you know, the money lenders who didn't get caught, I don't know, maybe they're using uh, Zcash now or something else. Or maybe they've, they've seen the light and stopped laundering money. Nah, no one believes that. Um, but, uh, you know, so, <laughs> so people are, are, are using some of the blockchain systems for nefarious purposes, right? Um, and then I'm also, I'm also kind of worried that most of the blockchain, uh, or most of the Bitcoin money, when we talk about those applications, are in just a couple of places. Not quite one, maybe, and maybe nine, somewhere maybe between those. It's, it's, I think it's like three top coins. But, um, you know, it's not, like when I, when I think about this promise of decentralization, I wasn't picturing replacing like three companies running the world with like three Bitcoin companies running the world. So we haven't quite gotten to a place where we have a lot of like smaller coins that are really gaining a lot of traction. And then uh, of course the government's been spending a lot of time looking at like how can they use this blockchain thing. Um, they're not, they're like a little more savvy. I think the internet, they didn't catch on for a little bit, but um, governments largely understand the internet now and, um, and they also largely understand blockchain and they've gotten really good at doing the traffic analysis for those systems that um, provide encryption from end to end and figuring out how to find the endpoints. 
And of course, um, we have to talk about the massive power usage. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit some of the ways to ameliorate that. But, um, you know, and I know, I know there's a couple of you thinking like, but fiat power, I mean, fiat money also uses power. And it's like, yes, it does. But if we're going to do more bigger, complicated things and we want more people to be using uh, blockchains and bitcoins for their stuff, then we're going to have massive power usage and we're going to have to address that. Um, and some folks are like, what about Quebec? They set up a whole thing over there by the hydroelectric thing. Um, uh, like hydro actually is, well, it's better than nuclear power because uh, it probably won't blow up um, and create like a Chernobyl-like system. But uh, hydro floods huge piles of land and disrupts habitats, displaces people, all kinds of stuff. So hydro is not like a perfect magic. Um, you know, we could talk about solar. I, I was thinking about, uh, you know, solar block blockchains. Like, that might be okay, right? Um, but, uh, yeah. So the, the power thing is an issue. So what we talk about when we talk about improving blockchain, and, and there are a lot of talks about it. They're like, this is a meeting for, about um, blockchain. Um, obviously, we can all go home. They fixed it. Um, no, uh, but there are like a ton of groups that are looking at, uh, you know, how to do smart contracts for humanitarian stuff. Um, these folks are looking at like policy, especially in the uh, European Union. Um, the MIT Sloan School, which is their business school. So MIT is largely known for its tech stuff. So they have this tech and business like kind of experiment going on. And then uh, the Institute for Blockchain Studies at Purdue. Um, so there's like there's so many different iterations and ideas out there like the the sheer volume of academic papers on blockchain and what it could do and what it might do is it's staggering it's like there's like so much stuff um, but nobody actually has anything that I think addresses some of the core things with blockchain which is that um, both, both the proof of stake and the proof of work end up as this uh, very efficient mechanism to make it easy for the richer participants to become richer, uh, while the poorer participants uh, don't. And so, uh, in my mind, like the the thing that we are making efficient, if all we are making efficient is a system where rich people get richer, uh, they don't need our help. They're actually doing really good already. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, I don't want to put a picture of like, you know, Jeff Bezos up or anything, but like, they don't really need our help getting richer. So, um, none of those academics are looking at it from that direction. They're all kind of thinking about like, oh, well, what kinds of smart contracts shall we have? Or like, you know, how shall we go and take, take the blockchain to the rest of the world? Um, so, uh, you know, so I'm worried that we're not looking at the things that we ought to be looking at. So, the contract, we talked a little bit about how um, contracts, if you're not like contract literate, which I, I don't know how we ended up in a society with a, like a whole profession that is dedicated to writing dense, non-human readable contracts, but here we are. Um, even if the transactions are transparent and easy to understand, if the contract itself is not easy to understand, then we have problems. Uh, the nodes, this is another thing like, like, oh, you can't, you know, you can't game the, the coins and the, and the blockchain systems because um, you would have to take over 51% of the network. Well, you can actually do that. And it turns out now it only needs to be 34% of the network. Um, so the nodes, like the idea that individually they couldn't take over the network, but collectively they could. So, so there, are, there are some issues there to look at. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the blockchain systems take that into account as like, you know, just a cost of doing business. Like the, the network will be attacked every so often and we'll lose a chunk of money and, you know. Um, so... So there are people talking about how do we how do we spread that you know system out with the nodes so that we're more uh, robust and less likely to be hacked. 
Uh, and then this one is very uh, interesting, especially with some of the less, like, not the Bitcoin stuff, but other places where you're like, oh, we're going to do these contracts or we're going to try and set up these, um, you know, systems that will help people in more remote places, things like that. The, uh, the initiator, which is, that's like the beginning of the chain, right? So, like, you know, if, if you couldn't get things in and you couldn't get things out, like nobody would really care about any of the blockchain stuff because what, what use would it be? It would just be this theoretical exercise. But um, at some point, it has to start in the real world. And, um, and so you have like a, <laughs> uh, like a situation where like, what if nobody's seen the initial input? So you've taken an initial input that maybe no one's seen, and then put it into a system that is then like, you know, this is inviolably accurate. Like we can guarantee that it is completely, you know, what you're, what you're looking at is completely correct, except for the very first step, which is actually a really big one. So the, the land in Florida, if you don't know, this was like a, you know, people went to Florida, part of a weird part of the US um, that mostly looks like this actually. Um, not like Miami Vice, we, there is that too, but, um, but most of it looks like this. And uh, so people went back up to like New England and, and the Midwest and said, hey, I bought land in Florida, it's amazing. And they showed them this picture of a beach and stuff. And they're like, you know, I mean, it's, it's too bad you weren't able to get in on this deal with me. I mean, you know. And then the other person's like, oh, I wish I had bought Bandon for it. And they're like, well, I mean, I did buy two plots, so I can maybe sell you one. And then they sold it, like, it became this huge thing where each of them sold, you know, at an upsell over and over again. So, like, you know, eventually someone went down and was like, I own a swamp full of angry alligators. And I paid, like, half the cost of my house for it. And the alligators won't even leave. <laughs> like, so you end up with this, like, so what I'm saying is that the initial point from the real world that goes in and then becomes codified and certified and guaranteed to be correct is important. So um, that's one of the things that we look at. So the future. So like, you know, I want us to think like what kind of future are we building with, with these new technologies? And, um, you know, a lot of people are like, we're building this amazing paradise. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, I can't wait to throw off the tyranny of government and, like, sit in a hammock. It's going to be great. Um, and I like hammocks. Don't get me wrong. You know, or, uh, or we're going to be rich. It's going to be great. We're going to have, like, money for all the things. Um, we could like build this new economy where we could fund niche musicians. We could, you know, uh, fund the development and creation of like smaller stuff, like crowdfunding, but like with a little bit of different kind of responsibility um, in there. Uh, some things that might be legal in one place and not in another, or paid for in another place. Like, you know, one place has good health care, one place doesn't. For instance, um, we could get, uh, we could end up with. Jetpacks. I was always sad that we didn't get jetpacks. I feel like we were promised jetpacks, right? Um, the reason we don't have jetpacks is because uh, insurance companies are like, wait, what? You guys are going to fly around in three-dimensional space? And you want, what? no, oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. Um, but if we could insure ourselves, like all of us who wanted jetpacks, then maybe it would be okay. So that's like a thing, you know, we might even be able to manage the three-dimensional traffic in real time in an inviolable thing because, you know, timing actually matters when you have a lot of people flying around in jetpacks, and that's one of the things that blockchain is really good at securing and, uh, and saying, like, yes, this, is, this exactly happened at this time, right? Um, and so, like, yes, you can take your jetpack in there, which would be great. Um, on the, on the darker end of it, like, you know, like I, I said before, we, we have the potential to, like, very efficiently um, create a situation where the rich get much, much richer very quickly, and then everybody else kind of suffers. This is from a movie called Metropolis, where they literally everyone who is not a billionaire lives in the basement. 
um, and they they like work at a factory and crank things for like 12 hours a day in gray coveralls. Um, you know, we'll probably still be allowed to have like fun spandex outfits or whatever, but um, I, uh, you know, I don't want to live in the basement. Just saying. Um, it's probably going to end up somewhere in the middle. I don't think we're either going to end up with the like, you know, amazing like redistributed wealth hammock wonderland where nobody has to work again, nor the Fritz Lang metropolis like, you know, except for 12 of us, everyone lives in the basement. Um, but it's probably going to involve more suits than we think. Like this idea of like, oh, it's going to be this great, you know, like power to the people. But um, like I said, we've already seen a lot of like government interest in using blockchain. Uh, we've seen a lot of um, we've seen a lot of banking, like traditional banks. Goldman Sachs is like really interested in blockchain, uh, and they want to like see how they can uh, make things happen there. Uh, which is, you know, when you think about like, oh, we're redistributing power. I didn't really think of Goldman Sachs as first on the list. Um, again, they're they're probably doing okay without us. Uh, another thing that I think is really interesting is the like hybrid semi-anonymous but like still connected to a bank solution. So, um, so Digicash is an early example of this that got thwarted because of the software patents on it, which I thought was really like, oh yeah, another thing that we um, threw by the wayside because of software patents. And it's not that there aren't software patents on other blockchain stuff currently, but the ones on that we're holding Digicash back have expired. So what Digicash does is uh, it has a nut, like they have a, a better anonymization on the way in to the blockchain, um, but then you still have a thing where the recipient gets money and uh, it goes into an actual bank so they can be audited and taxed and you know can't take money for weird illegal stuff uh, so easily. Um, so those hybrid solutions might end up actually being pretty good um, if. If people were building them, there's right now there's Digicash, and then there's a GNU project called GNU Taller where they're looking at that. Um, it has a, a ways to go as far as user friendliness, I'll say. Um, you know, but they're they're writing papers. Uh, like I said, if if writing academic papers turns out to be the solution to the you know utopia where blockchain controls everything, then we are doing our best. There's a lot of papers. Um, the other thing I like I think about is like the the social so we have a lot of like kind of lifestyle brands like like Facebook and Twitter and Apple and some of them already have ways to pay within the app and so like so on the like terrifying things we should try to not have happen like rewarding people for their social behavior for as if it were like some work in a blockchain system would be pretty terrible um, I already like it already feels to me like people are sort of fake on social media, but if, like, not all people, of course, and not all the time, but uh, if, if we allowed a system where fractional changes in behavior could be financially rewarded on social media, I think that'd be pretty gross. Um, or, you know, uh, other companies like Amazon that sell you things, like having you be able to like do product reviews, because you can already do like a product review and get like a $5 credit, or like um, a lot of them have, uh, whoops, like bring a friend and you get like $10 credit. So like companies are already looking at it these ways, like how can we make it seem uh, like, how can we financially reward you for pretending to be more excited about our product and our company? Um, and so, like, they're already, like, looking at these things, but, uh, you know, if, we, if we've got a lot of folks that are not employed or underemployed, then, you know, I, I don't want to see this, like, kind of feudal company town thing where everyone is behaving in the way that the company wants them to behave so that they can get their crumbs and their, their things delivered. Um, that worries me. So, uh, so like the, the idea of having like a having work being done on a social network, I think is like that. We should not we should not build that. Um, there is some legislation that's looking at uh, how to like control some of the blockchain stuff. Um, um, un unfortunately, like, uh, well, 
Each country is a little different, uh, but uh, politicians tend to listen to folks who already have more money than they do to individuals. So a lot of the legislation that's being talked about would, uh, would just make it more efficient and get things out of the way for uh, larger players to come into the space and not necessarily support and bring in smaller players. Uh, China actually just recently is looking at legislation, I think it would take effect in the middle of this month, that would make anonymous blockchains illegal. So that's like not for the individual user, that obviously is for the government's interest. So, you know, so the legislation that's being talked about is not going to be like, oh sweet, we're going to, you know, nothing to like protect individuals is being discussed so much as like, it's, it really all tends to go more towards, we want to make sure the government gets its revenue and its taxes and its share of the, uh, of the you know, this whole thing that is happening. Um, and there's even like a discussion, like it came all the way back around again where they're like, maybe we should turn our regular like government issued money into like Bitcoin. Um, and uh, let's see, I think Venezuela is talking about this. I don't know if that could possibly help the situation there at all. Um, and then there's like a, a dude in Puerto Rico who was like, we should just have a, a Puerto Rican like state level Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not like, I'm not certain that that person has like the best interest of Puerto Rico at heart. Like it's sort of, sort of like, oh, and then, you know, but it would all be me. Like I would issue these coins and then like basically I'd own Puerto Rico. And it's like, eh. So like some of the government issued coins um, don't have, uh, like it, it thwarts the whole decentralization idea that was part of the promise. And then on top of that, it brings it back to this like weird, like, wait, so now instead of like, you know, owing the IRS, we owe the government Bitcoin guy. Like, I don't know how that works. Um, but it's, yeah, it, again, we would have like this currency being issued without having any of the accountability that we would have whatever, you know, the diffuse responsibility or accountability that we have with governments currently. Um, and then we've been looking at uh, some of the, so some of this reminds me of some of the utility deregulation stuff where um, it's like instead of taking on any responsibility, we just sort of like let the bigger fish eat the smaller fish until there are no small fish. Um, so what can we do? Um, so first of all, uh, like all of the all of the technology on top of this should remain free and open source software. Um, I think that's really really critical. Like if we can at least maintain that level of transparency, I think that's really critical. Um, also, the conversations that we have about uh, like oh, what should we like? Should we have Bitcoin instead of our regular fiat money for the entire like? island of Puerto Rico, like th there should be community voices at the table and not just the person who's willing to fund it. Um, but this is the case in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways. Like I think um, when we let government and business like decide what technology should be possible without community voices at the table, we don't end up with good outcomes. Um, I'd love to see us do more solar power. I don't know if that's like it within scope for this room, <laughs> but uh, maybe you'll get to build something that uh, helps people mine with sol solar power, and that would be great. It would also kind of like restore some of the historic inequalities that we have built in, where like weirdly the places with less sun have more money. So that would be kind of nice, right? It would be like a, a good evening out. Um, I also think that, uh, we, so, so one of the things that worries me when I see people talking about like disrupting certain systems and replacing them with blockchain is that uh, we haven't even really done a good job of getting electricity and internet to people. So uh, like, so this is from um, the, this is from the US like in the 1920s or so. And uh, the like dense places, cities, they all got electrical power right away because it was very lucrative to set up a network for dense, densely populated areas. Um, and then like the rural parts of the country were like, 
uh, we would, we've been left in the dark, literally. Um, and so they ended up forming citizen utility boards and stringing up their own electrical power because they didn't want to wait for companies to do it. Uh, and so they did this um, in a lot of different places. It happened again with internet because like, companies like Verizon were like, yeah, 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 we're going to wire up all of Kansas, don't you worry. For folks who are not from the US, Kansas is pretty sparse. Um, so they did Topeka, which is the, like, the little dense spot in Kansas, and then they just sort of didn't get around to the blanker spots, and they kept not doing it. They asked for government subsidies to help them with this Herculean task of setting up internet in the rest of the rural parts of Kansas, and then kept coming back every two years to be like, um, it was actually really hard, so we need more money from the government to do the thing we promised to do a couple years ago. So, uh, so blockchain is built on, it's layered. You can't have it without electricity and you can't have it without internet. So if we put a lot of important things over there without taking care of the lower layers, then um, we are really doing a great job of exacerbating the difference between haves and have nots in our society. Um, obviously, centralization, if we end up with like three Blockchain companies, instead of three other companies controlling all our stuff, that's not good. We need to have a decentralized network. And that means we need to create a system where a lot of different entities can come in. We can't just have like three coins or like one contract place. So it, it has to be a whole bunch. Um, and so, and I think we're going to have to support in the same way that we would support a citizen's utility board or like a you know, neighborhood mesh network, people putting together their own you know, like kind of homegrown types of systems uh, that would compete with the ones that are more funded. So, um, so I've given this a lot of thought. Um, I have some more reading if you want to do some more reading on this uh, and take a look at what you may do, and the, and the second one in particular is about the, the broadband. Uh, oh, well. uh, I work at the Software Freedom Conservancy, that just went by. Uh, we have a booth in the K room if you wanna come down and talk to us. Um, and then, uh, oh, we're going the wrong way, let's see. And then I would be happy to take a couple of questions from you, and then we can break for lunch. Thank you. Um, yes. Thank you, Deb Nicholson. Um, I think we have five minutes for questions and answers. Please uh, stay here and don't disturb if there are questions. So are there any questions? Okay, I'll be over here for a little bit yeah. too, like packing up if people want to ask a not for the whole room question. Okay, thank you again. Thank you.